All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here. And this is BXGS Weekly, a JavaScript news podcast. Um, this week, we don't really have too many news, but there are some very interesting things happening in the JavaScript uh, spec world. So we're going to talk about that. As usual, I've already created a markdown document with all the links that I'm going to be going through today. So you can find them on the BXGS Weekly repository on the GitHub. Um, yeah, let's get started. Our first news or first article is uh, called I am a mediocre developer by Nikita Sobolev. And um, this, I think this is the article I can relate a lot to because most of those points actually is pretty much what I do as well, right? So he goes on to talk about what he usually does as a developer and how he thinks that this makes him mediocre, which is exactly my point because I also Google all the simple things all the time. Hell, if I remember anything from the spec and if you watch my um, developer videos, you know that I keep Googling every single tiny thing because I forget how the things work, right? It's uh, by my opinion, this is like, this is normal, at least for me. And this is probably means that I'm not very good. Um, keep things straight, simple. That's also something that I basically come down with time, uh, to, and, uh, it's like, I used to try to complicate everything, but now I just try to keep it simple because I just can't remember stuff properly. That again, comes down to the same, you know, Googling for everything. So I try to give it as stupid, as simple as I can, which again, I think it doesn't really mean that I'm that good. I do not trust myself, not by any means. I try to write tests and whatever where, I mean, <laughs> yeah, hi, Mehmatrix, it's all of us. Well, um, I guess, I mean, I think, or I, I at least I wanna hope that there are people who are so good, they don't need any of that. And uh, yeah, but you know, like if you are striving to be a better developer, then um, the things that he lists here are a good reminder of what you should be doing, even though, you know, it kind of sounds like I'm a mediocre, but. To, to, to tell you the truth, the things that he actually describes are kind of a feats of a good developer. And um, mostly because, you know, like tests, CI, CD, making sure it only works not only on your computer, uh, but, you know, basically, yeah, trying to track everything after the app is already deployed. Because I always, I'm like, this is my nightmare, literally, when you deploy something and then it breaks in the middle of the night, you know, like you're, you're waking up in the morning and to just find out that everything is basically gone. But um, anyway, this is <laughs> might be in a great piece. So if you are interested in sort of these meta pieces that go into the details of a developer life, I can highly recommend reading that. Right, next thing we got the um, few feature requests or feature ideas for Node.js core. One of them is broadly support. So this ticket is still uh, open and has a pretty large discussion. And um, if you don't know, Broadly is a compression algorithms uh, made by Google, I think. I believe it was Google who made them. Yes, so it's a compression format made by Google and it's pretty good. Like it's, it's way better than gzip, for example, and shows a higher number. I think it's more expensive when you pack stuff, but uh, unpacking is cheaper basically because it was made for uh, web. So this is kind of why it uh, built that way. If I remember things correctly, again, I might be wrong here, but uh, don't take my word for it. But yeah, it would be uh, cool to see it in the core because I, I believe Node already had like gzip inside. So it's, you know, like adding that would not, yeah, you have Zilip, I believe. Um, and uh, then adding broadly or whatever comes next, as they suggest here, sounds like a reasonable idea. There's still a discussion obviously going on. This is not a decision that will gonna come easily, but um, yeah. And there's already like, yeah, stuff they like pointing out that V8 is not really have broadly, but Chromium does. So you the, including it in Node would mean pouring it to the either V8 itself, which doesn't even make a lot of sense, probably node core, like the node STD leave would make more sense. And obviously there are third party libraries that already do that. So we're gonna see where that ends up. But anyway, having more compression algorithms in the core means we have to drag in less libraries and uh, means faster and nicer working apps, right? So the second discussion is on um, adding fetch to node core. Uh, the ticket is now closed because the discussion grew a bit out of hand and uh, GitHub issues are not exactly the best place to discuss things because this is not an issue, right? There's a feature request and there's actually a whole large underlying discussion in here 
on whether it was implementing or how it should be implemented, what kind of uh, primitive should it give? Because Node, like the fetch API are very limited, right? In comparison to what you get from the Node.js HTTP module, there's like a lot of things missing. And uh, there was pretty big discussion on basically how to tackle that. And in the end, it ended up with the ticket closed and there's probably more discussion going on. But I can say that I completely support adding fetch into core because right now using HTTP for like HTTP library within node for doing requests is a bit of a pain in the ass and having something that is simpler would be very welcome. It might not be the fetch uh, directly, but I mean, you know, the API of the fetch is quite straightforward. So why the hell not? I'm usually using node fetch as you might've seen from my videos, but uh, you know, not needing to drag in another library would be uh, again, welcome. Right, next thing we have here is a small Twitter thread. Um, it is not exactly JavaScript, it's more like a front end one. So there's the a collection of uh, CSS snippets, which people use again and again, and it has to be a vanilla CSS and has to fit in one tweet. So the thread is actually very large, there's not even all of it loaded. But there are some very interesting things that you can pick up here. So I'm again, I'm not a CSS guy. So I typically Google for any CSS changes that I need to do. But I was able to find a couple of very interesting things here that I picked up, including there's like some even animation stuff and um, accessibility tips and people discussing things that you should not do and should do and all that kind of stuff, which is pretty interesting to read. So uh, basically, if you're interested in uh, CSS, and if you're interested in those kind of tiny snippets, I think it's always interesting to see them. Um, there's even some email client isolation snippets, which is insane. It's like targeting all Yahoo, Gmail. They have all, all of them have this specific CSS styles, which is in my opinion, insane. Like just imagining uh, making CSS for emails would probably drive me nuts. But anyway, if that's your thing, have a look. There's quite a lot of very interesting things in here. Right, next article called Making Music from Data. It is a Node.js based music generator that takes in your data and produces a MIDI file. Um, so there uh, basically, yeah, there's some music theory in here as well. So if you are not familiar with that, it might be some, I mean, I guess you would have to read a bit in Wikipedia on how that works, uh, but the idea is that, yeah, you take the data, then you generate the, uh, MIDI output, right, and save it to a MIDI file, and then you can play it and see what the hell's going on with your data in terms of sound. Interesting, pro I mean, it's just an interesting um, example, I guess, a small project that shows how to use a bunch of different um, modules and how to produce music or specifically MIDI files using the Node.js. I guess it will be also interesting to see how you could play it maybe from browser. So use it together with say uh, React frontend or whatever to produce or to play directly in the browser. I believe you can play MIDI's using the web uh, MIDI API or was it um, the, uh, what was it? Was web audio API, I think. But yeah, so it would be, could be an interesting project if you are into that. Right, continuing. There is a continuation of the short thing that I showed last time. So there was this, um, I think it was a code sandbox or something where um, I believe it was Wes Boss, the same um, thing that links here to the tutorial or maybe wasn't, I hell if I remember. So last time in the news, we had the code snippet that showed off how to build a, a essentially voice assistant in a tiny, tiny, uh, God damn, I'm terrible with English today. Okay, so last time there, <laughs> there was a code snippet it showed how to very easily build a voice assistant in browser, right? So this article goes into a bit more in depth and actually shows off a full fledged demo and um, how properly do that with a create Re react app, not react exactly, but you know, more or less the same and uh, goes into details uh, in adding skills. Uh, this is what you get from Alexa. If you never used Alexa, the idea of skill is that it's an extensible uh, module that basically allows you to say something. So uh, this, the author here goes to explain how he did it and and what the, you know how do you trigger it, how do you resolve it, how do you do actions and so on and so forth. Pretty interesting write up. Again, uh, pretty straightforward. So the uh, speech recognition API are quite easy to use. They are not unfortunately available in all browsers yet. I, I I'm not sure if, even if they are standardized, but they probably should be. 
Anyway, that works in, in Chrome and Safari, I believe. Uh, you can go ahead and try it out for yourself and maybe build your own voice assistant. It's always fun to try and play around with tech like this. Right, the next article we have is more of a release uh, announcement, I guess, rather than the article itself. It's called an IDE for React.js and uh, uh, Arno here builds a specific IDE for uh, React, right? So because it gives you like additional React tooling like this component here, um, component side pane that basically shows you the a bit more information about your component. Um, and uh, there is a demo here. So if you are writing React JS, you might have a look at that because there's some additional features like smart local autocomplete and components preview, which is probably the most interesting in my opinion. So it's also open source, which is you know always great and welcome. So if you are writing a lot of React, do give it a look. Um, I believe it is Electron based, so I haven't actually checked that, but it has to be right. And we have Electron, of course we have Electron. So yeah, there we go. Another hopefully nice Electron tool for React World. Right, continuing. We got the GPU accelerated neural networks in JavaScript. This is the article that essentially gives an overview of the state of the art in uh, of GPU accelerated neural networks in JavaScript. Uh, there are, I believe, three libraries here. Um, so, oh, okay, four libraries. So there's DeepLearn.js, which is um, quite, I mean, okay, it's actually Project Star. Okay, it's actually not that old. I, for some reason, thought it was like one of the oldest ones. I don't remember that the Brain.js was like super old, but it's no longer maintained, I believe. I don't know if it's actually, wait a second. Let me, let me just check. I'm curious now because um, last time I checked it, I don't think it was active, but there is a day ago. So it's actually quite active, okay. Tab, taking my words back, I, I guess it's active and I just didn't know about it. So Brain.js is, yeah, the oldest one, uh, GPU.js is basically, it's, it's actually not a neural network, uh, just put it this way, it's uh, just a thing to run GPU accelerated functions, basically essentially matrix multiplication. So it's just an abstraction to run some uh, matrix multiplication functions on the GPU, so I'm not sure why is it included here exactly, but I guess it kind of relates to the, um, neural networks, right? There's also Propel, uh, which was introduced recently. We already talked about it, I believe, on one of the podcasts. And there's a Deep Learn JS, which is a bit older, but also has already quite some uh, pretty cool demos, actually. So I believe it uses WebAssembly, if I remember correctly. You can uh, pre-build your uh, models in uh, Python and then throw them into the browser and use Deep Learn JS to actually uh, Present basically use them for the user. Hey, Shivan, nice to see you as well. Welcome to the stream. Okay, so there's also a few examples here. Um, you can see basically how the DeepLearn.js works, how Propel works, how GPU.js works. Once again, it's kind of like, I mean, it's my matrix multiplication library, so I'm not sure why they um, compare it to the complete like neural network libraries, but hey, so it's quite interesting to read anyway. Right, um, next thing is the off-screen canvas, which is happening in Chrome. It is right now behind the flag. And what that means is that you can actually take a canvas and render it in a service worker, which means that you can do a lot of really cool things like rendering um, complex graphics in the background. I imagine that will be extremely useful for games, for example, to sort of like, I, I'm not even sure. I mean, parallaxing works good enough with a simple canvas, but I imagine people who work in those areas know exactly what this will bring as benefits. I, for example, came up with the stupidest idea ever. So remember last time I showed this uh, CSS custom painters API, which allowed you to do like custom canvas based paintings and use them in CSS. And what I think is that you can use the canvas in um, service worker and offload the rendering to the service worker. I, at least I imagine you could do that. I'm not convinced, like I'm not 100% sure it needs to be tried, but if you could do that, that means you would have a separate thread that would render your fancy CSS uh, styling, which is kind of awesome. And uh, yeah, obviously there's like a Chrome status page and you can follow the status here and there's a new version app new app version here. So yeah, um, this spec seems to be what we g okay so yeah basically it's it's just interesting and um, i'm really curious when it will go um 
live basically without a flag. It also seems like it's not implemented in Safari yet at all and Edge as well. So we're gonna see how it develops. Anyway, it's pretty cool that you know you can actually use uh, rendering and use Canvas in service workers. So the next thing is the um, sort of additional article on Cloudflare workers. So I talked uh, last time in the last podcast that there are now like you can run workers on Cloudflare uh, with like extremely cheap pricing. And I was wondering like, you know, what are the use cases? And here's one of them. So you can actually use the workers to add some security headers to your uh, domain, even if you don't have direct control of the domain, for example, you host your ghost uh, blog on GitHub pages, uh, or anything GitHub pages website, basically, and you have a custom domain, right? So since the website is hosted somewhere else, you don't have direct access to the headers. But if you plug in your own worker, you can actually modify the headers. And here's even an example of how to basically do that. And the fact that you can basically do that without having access to the server is pretty neat. So by, you know, by adding the service worker, you could um, actually increase the security of your website and all of that for uh, quite new, I mean, quite reasonable price, essentially. Yeah. So going next, we got a pretty neat blog from Microsoft guys. So this is uh, ASP.NET blog. Um, you might be wondering why the hell am I talking about it on JavaScript podcast? Well, they introduced a thing called Blazor. Um, it's basically a framework and it allows you to, uh, it is still experimental. So worth noting, it allows you to use .NET, uh, C Sharp specifically and Razor, which I don't know what it is in browser using WebAssembly. So essentially what you can do is you can take your .NET project, use C Sharp library or whatever, and compile it to run in the browser, which will use WebAssembly as a target for all your logic. And then it will have some additional HTML, uh, which basically will render your stuff, right? So it is really, really cool to see more companies and more technologies adopting WebAssembly. Obviously, there's still like, you know, things that are missing from WebAssembly and there's another spec that is already in works. But I am very excited to see where all of this is going because it is really great that, you know, we have more tools to use for web development. So um, and in my opinion, C Sharp is a great language. So I've been using it for a couple of years and Back at the time, it had a lot of really cool things like a sync await, for example, it was in C sharp way before um, JavaScript. And I loved it there. And I love it in JavaScript. Right. Continuing, we got the article called how to write powerful schemas in JavaScript. So this is um, essentially an introduction to a new library called S. Uh, I mean, I don't know how to pronounce it. S C H M. I mean, shm, maybe shm, let's call it shm. So it's gonna be shm library. <laughs> Okay, so it's a library for uh, creating schemas in JavaScript and Node.js. I believe it works both in the browser and in the server. Obviously, it is not the only library and uh, schema validation is a pretty common uh, topic, especially in enterprise software or wherever you're writing something that relies heavily on data validation, right? Um, there's like libraries like Joy and stuff. But this is yet another one, uh, which actually seems to have pretty nice API. So you define the schema and then you can parse an object which will basically uh, also transform, apply the transformations if you have them, validate the values and so on and so forth. And if there are errors, it will basically throw them and explain in pretty um, nice way, because I know that like, my gripe with um, th schema validators at the time was that some of them didn't produce uh, errors that were clear enough. It always was like, hey, schema failed for whatever reason. And you're like, just sit and look there and like, okay, what's wrong? And you have to figure it out yourself. In this case, this shm thing actually tells you what exactly is wrong. And it seems to be uh, doing it in a pretty explicit way, which is great in my opinion. So also support for composable schemas, extendable schemas, and so on and so forth. And there's also comparison with AGV and joy and everything. So it's, uh, you know, if you require um, validating schemas and working with schemas, do have a look at this one. It looks pretty nice. So again, I haven't used it yet myself because I don't really, didn't really have any projects that require schema validation in the last years. But uh, yeah, definitely something I will keep in mind because it looks quite nice. Um, continuing, we got um, sort of a 
ranty thread on GitHub about uh, licensing. So if you have, if you publish or planning to publish open source projects, there is a very interesting comment from an ex and non-practicing lawyer who is now basically doing developments. And uh, there is a very long and extensive comment talking about the licensing issues and how you should think about licenses and how you should approach all of that stuff. And uh, I would actually recommend reading the whole thread here because there's some very interesting uh, discussion going on about like what kind of licenses you put into your libraries, you know, and so on and so forth. So it's always, it's, you know, it's, it's a very um, sensitive topic, let's put it this way, because you don't want to be essentially, um, I'll just gonna stop here. Let's, let's not go into details. I can talk about it for too much. Basically just read it. It's very interesting. All right, continuing, we got the smaller Lodash bundles with Webpack and Babel. So this is, um, it goes over to explain how you can use the Lodash ES6 imports, which if you didn't know it has. So um, basically you can import function from specific function files instead of importing it as a, as a ES6 import. Um, and then there is the Babel plugin Lodash um, that allows you to, okay, there's a bunch of plugins. There's Babel plugin Lodash, Lodash Webpack Loader, and so on and so forth that basically will convert this into this and then optimize the loading and decrease your library size from, you know, because you, you don't include the whole Lodash. I mean, it's like 68 kilobytes. It's quite big, but not too big, but you can make it smaller because you can import just the functions you need and decrease the size to a few kilobytes. And the whole thing is that basically you can do it automatically by just adding a couple of plugins to Webpack and to Babel. So, if you didn't know that, go read this article. It gives a pretty good explanation of how to do that and um, the whole reasoning and nice diagram showing how you can decrease the size of your bundle, essentially. You're resulting in 590 bytes, which is actually quite surprising. Okay, continuing. Um, this is an article called Elegant Patterns in Modern JavaScript Raw Raw. This is the stupidest name I've ever heard for a pattern, but I will go with it because I do like that pattern uh, as well. And you've probably seen me using it a lot. So the this raw raw thing translates to receive object, return object. And the idea is that instead of giving your function um, inputs as parameters, like arguments, right? You actually give it as an object. The reasoning is that if you have some parameters that are Boolean, this is a very common anti-pattern, right? Because when you see a function call like this, you want to know what that means. And it's, it's really hard to reason about that, right? So unless you have some some sort of uh, IntelliSense or code intelligence that will tell you what the hell are those parameters, you'll be just sitting there and be like, ah, what, is this? what does this true mean, right? But if you pass it as an object, which means you have to invoke it like this, you will know exactly what this true means in this case. So uh, whenever I have more than one argument, I think I now in like 99% of cases do the object uh, passing because destruction just makes it so much nicer. And the same goes for returning. So um, I don't know if there's a return example in this article. There probably should be because yeah, return values, there you go. So the, yeah, the idea is that obviously you can return an object with uh, fields, with properties, right? And um, you can destruct those properties and get whatever you need from that. So that's a very, like, I don't, I don't know if the, the whole pattern deserves a whole like large article unless you are not familiar with destruction and uh, object assignments, which I guess you should be unless, you know, you're just started JavaScript. So, but anyway, it's a good pattern. This, this is why I wanted to highlight this. So if, again, if you're not familiar with this approach, this pattern and with destructing and maybe you want a refresher, then go ahead and read it. It's pretty good. Continuing, we got uh, look aheads and look behinds in JavaScript regular expression. So this is something that is coming in uh, ES 2018, I believe it's not yet implemented, but this is something that have been available in regular expressions for other languages and platforms for quite some time. And uh, JavaScript basically doing a catch up here, right? So the idea is that you can actually look ahead and 
predict you know what's going to be there um do they have any better yeah there you go so this regex will only match max that has the musterman after it right and um no wait this is a capture group the typical look ahead yeah okay uh Positive look aheads. Uh, I guess I mean positive look aheads are not as interesting as the negative ones. I guess, but basically the idea is that yeah, you can match a pattern with something being in front of it, right? Because doing it with um, without look aheads is a bit of a pain in the ass. I mean, you can still do it, but the regular expression becomes extremely complex. And then you have negative look aheads, which are even harder to do without look ahead. I, I remember there were some cases where it was even not possible doing it simply. So this is what actually makes it very easy, right? So this, in this case, we are selecting all the people who are not vegan, right? So it's going to select these three guys, uh, these three guys, there we go, um, and drop the two vegans from there which is uh, pretty great. So uh, they are already supported in Chrome actually, which is pretty interesting. Are they behind the flag probably, right? Um, da -da -da. Yeah, they are behind the flag, okay. So, uh, but it is pretty cool. So I'm really waiting when this is gonna be available in Chrome and Node.js. Um, it does open quite a lot of possibilities and makes writing regular expressions like 10 times easier. So yeah. All right, next thing we have is actually something I picked up today. And um, apparently some people are uh, specifically here. Um, I, I honestly don't know her name, but uh, her she goes by the Twitter handle, maybe cats. And um, she, like, she's gonna be pioneering or how is it called champ championing the proposal on pattern matching in JavaScript. If you are not familiar with pattern matching, uh, then, well, it's a very powerful concept from functional programming. The idea is that you can match results uh, or match the variable to something and depending on the match, you can execute a function or return something, right? So in this case, you can see fetching the JSON service and then matching if it's status to 100 and the header have content length. So there is something there. You can uh, actually destruct the content length and then get the, um, so this is, I guess, this is the function that executes. No, this is the function that matches as well. It gets the content length and then types the uh, response size. So this is 404, it will say not found. And then you have the destruct the status and then you say if status is more than 400, then there's a request error. I would be very interested to read. So there's no full proposal yet. Uh, it's still in works. And I would be very interested to see the full syntax of this because this does looks interesting. And obviously there are libraries that you can just use right now for all of that, but they are, um, I mean, they all feel hacky, right? Because it's, it's in any way, it's gonna be kind of hacky. Um, it's not exact pattern matching. It's mostly you just invoke functions, obviously, as you would. It does not have any other syntax and so on and so forth. So it would be really cool to see the full proposal. And um, basically figure out, you know, how cool that would be in JavaScript. So looking forward to it, really looking forward to it because JavaScript becomes more functional and uh, definitely, I'm definitely liking it. All right, continuing, we got um, a tweet from Axel Rauschmeier um, with some background on why we don't have proper tail calls. You might remember that proper tail calls were promised in ES6 or ES2015 quite some time ago, but they were never implemented. So there are basically sub thread here on Twitter explaining what the hell happens, so, you know, Apple liked them, Microsoft didn't, Firefox didn't, Google implemented behind switch and there's like debugger problems and won't lead this, the proposal and so on and so forth. So there is now a new proposal, which is called uh, syntactic tail calls, which is opt-in uh, tail calls, right? So the idea is that you can say return continue and then pass in the same function and that won't result in um, what is it called? Stack, not stack overflow. What was the name for it? Uh, so basically whenever the stack, is it stack overflow? No, it's not stack overflow. <laughs> uh, maximum call stack exceeded. This is what I'm talking about. 
Right. So if you are like if you would normally call this without continue, the stack will be exceeded and you will get an error saying, hey, you you know, you did a recursion too many times. But if you return continue, it will actually do the proper tail calls, but they basically have to be syntactically denoted as such. So this is, I believe, the current proposal that is being worked on, which I guess is a nice alternative to the real uh, tail calls. And, you know, since there are issues with them and we cannot break the web, why not? Let's, let's just add another uh, keyword for, I mean, it's not even another keyword. It's, it's an existing keyword, right? It's just from the loops and it kind of makes sense here. So very interesting to see where that goes. I'm uh, going to keep the track on the progress here. All right. So I think that's it for the news. We're coming to the releases section here. The first one being D3JS 5.0 released March 22nd. There are um, obviously since the major, there are some breaking changes. And the coolest thing is it now uses promises, which is freaking amazing. I mean, I, I love T3JS and this is probably my go-to library for data visualization, but man, do I have to like, <laughs> use callbacks or at least I had to use callbacks every time I used it, but now it actually uses promises. So you can evade all of that stuff and uh, use it in like, I think this is the biggest change here. So because all the other API is more or less stable. Um, and yeah, it's like, it's great. It's awesome. You know, I, I love promises. I love async wait, as I already said, and it's great to see more libraries adopting it. So. Um, the next minor release is the Node 9.9. There are some assert changes, uh, some crypto changes, and some other minor changes, and new collaborator, uh, which is always great to see. So, you know, we can update to this release. Don't think there's anything major in it. So, waiting for Node 10, which should come in uh, next month, I believe. Uh, so, we're going to see how that evolves. All right, next update we got is, um, so I've opened the extra frame page, but uh, this is actually NPM JS website. Uh, so if you haven't noticed over the past week, uh, they've updated the design. It now looks way nicer, way cleaner. And you now have those nice bar charts, uh, it, it's not a bar chart, it's like nice charts that show the download over time, which is pretty great, so. You know, that's all always nice. You got like dependencies, dependence, versions, you know, can properly see versions, all versions in here. I don't I don't even remember if it was possible in the old websites, uh, including the deprecated versions and everything. So it's pretty cool. All right. Next update is um, not exactly JavaScript related, but I think I, I just wanted to highlight it because it's such an incredible tool. So if you didn't know there is a, a graphic design or a drawing tool called Krita, it is something like Photoshop for um, artists, right? Um, like not, not Photoshop in terms of photo editing, but Photoshop in terms of drawing. And it is completely open source. So they released the version uh, version 4.0 and you can just go ahead, download it. You can look at the source code if you want. It has some amazing tools and if you are Looking for um, a tool to just quickly edit some things, this works incredibly well. So this is like, whenever I don't need uh, Photoshop install or you know, whenever I have like additional machines where I need to install something that is not Photoshop because you have to buy, buy more licenses. I have like a subscription which provides like three, I think computers at, at max. But when I need to edit something quickly and lightly, this is probably my go-to tool, so. If I had a pixel grid, it seems nice. Okay. So yeah, basically, you know, if you're looking for drawing tools, this one is definitely recommended. And it, again, open source. Hey, it's great. Right, we're coming to the library section. So first library of today is called Notarize. Um, I guess it's more of a command line tool than a library. It's essentially a um, scaffolding tool for creating a node apps. And uh, it only works with Node 8 and later, but I guess it's fine because, you know, I mean, Node 8 is LTS currently and we're got a Node 10 coming very soon, which is going to be LTS as well. So if you're still on the older versions, it's about time to move forward. Uh, but yeah, basically it scaffolds the app for you. It adds some nice scripts here, sets up uh, Prettier, Jest, Babel, Flow, whatever you can imagine. Um, so if you are into that, if you are in need of scaffolding the apps uh, frequently, then this might be for you to have a look. It looks quite nicely done. 
I personally don't really write that many or don't create that many apps from scratch daily. So I don't really in, I'm not really in the need of a scaffolder. So I prefer to do it manually because then I have more control over it. But uh, you know, again, if that fits your use case, do have a look. Okay, next thing we have is a React testing library by Cansey Dots. Um, it's essentially a wrapper around a bunch of React testing libraries that encourages good practices, just as it basically says. And um, yeah, it's it it looks pretty great. So I I've tried to play around with it, and essentially it just simplifies the setup and gives you a bunch of nice helpers. Uh, so simulate is just a shortcut for React DOM test utils. There are get by label text, get by placeholder text, get by text. Those are the simple API that basically allow you to get the DOM elements by the text inside them that can be quite helpful. And normally in React, you would have to do it yourself, you know, manually, which is annoying, but here you can just use the bunch of helpers. So essentially it's a very lightweight, very nice uh, test helper utils. So pretty great. All right, continuing, we got uh, librmath.js. It is a pure JavaScript implementation of a statistical R uh, library called librmath. Uh, they also call it core library. I think it's like one of the core libraries in R. Uh, I think this is interesting if you are working with the math in JavaScript. I don't know why you would do that, but um, I guess if you are, that would be the library to have a look at because they do have a bunch of very advanced things here that they do. So there's like a you know bunch of distributions and random number generators, pseudo random number generators, so on and so forth. So basically, if you ever need complex math library, then this seems to be like one of the um, good ones to look at. The documentation is also incredibly large. Yeah, so there's this. Continuing, we got the Cosmos. It is a uh, design system from the Ostero guys. Um, it looks very nice. Uh, so essentially it provides you with uh, all the primitives that you might need uh, for designing a nice looking websites. I guess it, it goes along with uh, the design principles. Uh, yes, you can inject your own libraries uh, to the stream if they are new. I am always, as I said, I always welcome all the new links uh, to articles, libraries, releases, whatever you can uh, find that is you think good or whatever you publish yourself. I would be happy to cover that as well because I mean, come on, we always need more better libraries and uh, more fun libraries, right? Okay, so yeah, this is a design framework with uh, nicely looking buttons, placeholders, inputs and everything, you know, is just CSS framework, right? A bit more than that actually, but uh, if you are looking to build a website that looks nice, then this is a pretty good thing. And uh, yeah, so you can check it out. There's also a Hello World example here with the Webpack. Do have a look at it if you are into the design area. Okay, read env. Oh yeah, I remember you. <laughs> yes, okay, I'm gonna put it over here. And uh, first gonna throw my list and then I'm gonna talk about your library. Okay, um, so we got a library called Gestalt from Pinterest. Um, I don't know why they called it Gestalt, but whatever. So it's a React UI component set from the guys back at Pinterest and uh, it actually looks pretty good. So as you might imagine, you know, Pinterest guys know what they are doing, they have a great looking website, I won't say anything about the way it works. In my opinion, it's bad, it's really bad. But um, the framework itself is actually really, really good. And there are some really solid React components here. So if you are looking for more React components, do have a look at it. It does come with a CSS include, so you will need to load it using the Webpack loader for CSS, otherwise it won't work. Uh, but yeah, it's a pretty decent uh, framework. So. Continuing, we got better SQLite 3, which is, as the author claims, the fastest and simplest library for SQLite 3 on Node.js. And um, they do provide the um, comparison with other libraries. And it seems like the better SQLite is indeed faster. I'm not sure uh, how they achieve this speed. There's no explanation of that, but it does seem to be quite good. So basically, if you are looking for embeddable database um, or SQLite 3 specifically, maybe then do give a look uh, to this library, it seems to be pretty great. 
and uh, at least it seems to be pretty fast. The API also pretty straightforward, so you know, uh, yeah, do have a look at it. All right, and uh, as the pre-final thing, because we got a new library uh, to show off at the end, is the OS Ocliff. I, I guess Ocliff it will be um, is an open um, CLI framework um, for quick creation of command line tools from Salesforce and uh, Heroku guys. Uh, Heroku CLI and Salesforce CLI are built using that thing. Uh, so, you know, if you like them and you are looking again for the scaffolder that would help you build that, do have a look at this. It does scaffold everything in TypeScript. So uh, if you are not into TypeScript, you might not want this, but uh, then again, you know, again, um, if that's your cup of tea, do have a look um, again supports node eight plus which again makes sense since uh, six will each uh, reach end of live at april um wait 2019 i thought it was 18. i'm a bit confused right now. okay maybe this wait a sec i have to google that wait a second um end of life where is the end of life and da, 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 end of life oh, okay it is 19. okay so there's still one year okay i thought it would be quicker actually Okay, then it's not too pressing, but I mean, no date is LTS anyway, so hey. All right, um, library provided by Mechmetrix uh, called readenv. Uh, it is a um, basically parser for environmental variables that converts them into nice and easily readable JSON objects, so you don't have to do it yourself. So you can even have complex objects and arrays and everything in your environment, and then you just get the nice object with all of that properly parsed so if you are looking for something like this if you are looking to providing complex configuration using environment variables do have a look at this library it's pretty good and i remember uh, if i remember correctly it's actually used by um wait a second there should be dependence by some big company um dependency graph dependence i think it was like uh, Sentry, yes. So as you can see, Sentry guys are using it here. So it should be good enough for you as well. Right. Um, that's basically it for libraries. Uh, now we got the stupid silly question of uh, not question section. First silly thing is the XKCD um, 404 page. I think this is <laughs> this is the 404 page, which well I will add to my own website because this is just brilliant. So if you really want to make people mad at the 404 page that says this content is not available in your country, I think this is like, especially, you know, for a person living in Germany, because up, up until uh, I think a year ago, they had this association GEMA, which uh, manages the music rights and half of the videos on YouTube were not playable because of it. And you always saw this, hey, this, you know, this video is not available in your country because GEMA and you're like, oh, damn you. So yeah, still feel that. I guess if you're living in America or something that is not so relevant for you, but uh, anywhere outside America, it is quite a pain in the ass. And the last thing I have is the commit strip uh, comic called new E6. Um, it's a silly one, it is also very funny. So there's like a discussion, a lot of people saying, like arguing which browser is new E6, is it Chrome, is it Safari? But anyone who used ES6 knows nothing and nobody will ever traumatize you as much as the fucking ES6 did. <laughs> that is absolutely true. If you ever worked with Internet Explorer 6, it was terrible. Nothing ever comes even close to it. <laughs> all right. Um, that's basically all I have for today. Um, wait, let me just quickly open BXJS Weekly just to have something as a block here. As usual, as I said, I publish all of those articles up here. Um, you know what we're gonna do? We are gonna put that here and I'm gonna edit this uh, markdown and I'm gonna add this library into the libs. All right, uh, uh, read. All right, so if you guys have any other things you wanna discuss, some maybe news I did not notice, or you are watching this on YouTube and you have cool news for, cool news, God damn it! If you have cool news for the next week, do send them over my way on Twitter, on GitHub, open an issue here, whatever, uh, directly on Twitch, directly on YouTube and comments. I'm always happy to see more new cool projects, cool links, cool articles. There's always really cool to read. And I'm saying word cool way too many times. I should probably not do that. <laughs> right. So yes, um, 
doesn't seem like there are any more things you guys want to discuss. So I guess we can wrap it up here. It's been um, this. I mean, this week is not as fruitful on news and uh, libraries and releases, but still had some pretty cool things going on, at least uh, with the Node and JavaScript uh, TC39 stuff happening. Always exciting to see the language develop. Uh, so as I mentioned, the next week I'm going to be traveling. I am not sure what's going to be happening with the stream on Wednesday. Uh, basically on Wednesday, it won't happen for sure because I will be traveling to Berlin. And uh, we're going to see how I'm going to be. Uh, basically, I'm, I still don't know what I'm going to be doing in, in uh, Entrepreneur First there on Thursday, Friday. We have the kickoff event and then some other event happening. So I have no idea what's going on, basically. I am going to be back on Saturday and we are going to have BXGS Weekly happening uh, Saturday, 8 p.m. as today, basically. And I'm hoping to have that every week. I will have Entrepreneur First streams as well because a lot of you guys asked about it. And I will also try to squeeze in the programming streams, although I'm not entirely sure we'll have time for that, but uh, we're gonna see how that's gonna go, basically. Right, doesn't seem like there are any more libraries or anything to discuss, so I guess we can just stop it here. Um, thank you for watching, thank you for staying with me, and I see you next time. Bye.